Okay, uh, we're here today at a Cove hardwood stand near Milam, Texas. Uh, just up the hill here was the site of the SFA Forestry Field Station uh, in the 1970s and early 1980s. So many field station students would have uh, seen this stand right here. Uh, we're on National Forest property, and as we look around at a Cove hardwood stand, uh, we don't have many of these in East Texas because our topography is relatively flat. And so you'll see this more in mountainous regions like the Southern Appalachians. But a cove is basically an area where ridges uh, shelter it on three sides. And so in a cove, you generally have really high diversity of trees and herbaceous species. Um, you usually have very high productivity, but that productivity will vary depending on the slope position. So at the very top of the ridges, often the soils are thinnest. Uh, they've eroded off under the action of gravity. And so you'll have lower site indices and you'll often have xeric sited species up there on the ridge tops. Meanwhile, at the very bottom of a cove slope position, you'll tend to have a lot of soil that's accumulated uh, as it's moved downhill via gravity. So that's called colluvium. So the colluvium will have accumulated at the bottom. You'll have a creek, usually at the bottom in a cove and so you may have some alluvial movement of, of parent materials and soils as well. And you generally have high site indices and great diversity in the bottom of a cove. Um, the composition will vary greatly. You might have species at the bottom of a cove like American beech, uh, in this part of the world at least, magnolia, uh, various red oaks and white oaks like this big white oak here, Quercus alba. Um, whereas at the top of the hill, you might have species uh, such as uh, our more xeric sided oaks. That may be where you find black jack oak, blue jack oak. That may be a site more suitable to shortleaf pine, for example. Uh, however, as you move between the top of the slope and the bottom of the slope, what you find is that mid slope positions can actually accumulate what we call colluvial benches. So as material erodes downhill, it'll collect at a mid slope position and you get very deep soils. Now these soils may not have a lot of nutrition, you know, in a per square or cubic foot basis, um, but they're deep. And deep soils with deep rooted species like trees means that you have access to a lot of water and a lot of nutrients. And so you may have really productive mid slope positions on these colluvial benches where species further east than East Texas, species like yellow poplar, tend to really thrive there. Um, however, in East Texas, again, it's just gonna be a mix. So looking around this stand, I'm seeing species like American holly. Uh, we've got different basswoods out here, both Carolina basswood and white basswood. We do have a pine component in here. I'm seeing a lot of loblolly pine. I'm seeing some shortleaf pine. Uh, I already mentioned our white oak Quercus alba. I'm seeing various ash trees, uh, white ash and green ash. Um, it looks like we have bitternut hickories, which are a great indicator that you've got you know, pretty rich soils, a rich site. And so it's just an incredibly diverse uh, forest in the overstory. In the understory, we've got beautyberry. You can see a lot of giant cane. Uh, we can see some yopon, uh, sweet gum, and hop hornbeam, hornbeam. Um, there's a lot of uh, arrowwood viburnum out here. So a, a number of different species, a pretty diverse stand. In terms of a cover type, uh, when you look at the SAF Forest Cover Type Manual by Air from 1980, this really doesn't closely fit anything that we would typically find in East Texas. Um, about the closest thing you can find is a black oak, red oak, white oak cover type that's more commonly described as being in the Appalachians. I don't know if I've seen any Quercus velutina, any black oak in here, and obviously we, we don't get northern red oak this far south. You would find it up in Arkansas, but not in East Texas. Um, so the red oaks that you see in here um, are going to be at the bottom of the hill, maybe Schumar oak, uh, species like that. Uh, Mid-slope and higher slope positions, we may get into some southern red oak. But cover type-wise, that, that's about the closest we've got for this Cove Hardwood site. Okay, uh, the Forest Service in terms of management here, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of management. Um, this is an area, I, I don't know what the plan is for it, but there's no evidence of a lot of management in recent history. Um, this site, despite the fact that it appears to be an uneven aged stand, is most likely even aged. When you look at the larger diameter trees around here, they tend to be the pines and some of the oaks. So they're going to be our early successional and maybe our mid-successional species. You're not seeing those late successional species that are too large. 
And then as you start looking at the trees that are smaller, they're probably not smaller because they're much younger. They're smaller because they're different species. We're seeing species like black gum, uh, mayhaw, yopon, hollies in the, the mid-story and understory positions. And so the composition is what's dictating how the canopy stratifies, not the age. Uh, when we compare a site like this with an old growth stand, you'll really start seeing those differences. Unless you know that a stand is uneven aged in the U.S. South, it is most likely even aged in terms of its origin. So in terms of managing a stand like this in a cove hardwood situation, your big challenge operationally is that you are on a steep slope. And so with a steep slope like this, traditional logging equipment may have difficulty operating. Uh, depending on where you are in the country, there are a number of different options here. Um, out west, they have many cable yarding systems uh, where they may take a large piece of equipment, basically a big winch with a tower, set it up at the top of the slope, and then they run a cable down the steep slope. Uh, at the bottom of the hill, they may climb a tree up 50 feet or so, a, a big tree, cut it off there and use that as an anchor tree. And people would come down this steep slope with chainsaws and hand fell the trees. It's a very dangerous operation, very difficult work. Uh, but they would hand fell the trees and then someone else would come in and they would put a cable choker on it, just a, a cable that they loop around the tree, and they would hook that up to basically the winch and pull them up to the top of the slope. They try not to pull them to the bottom of the slope because if you're pulling the logs to the bottom of the slope in a cable yarding system, you can't stop them. Gravity will take them right into the middle of your operation. It's very dangerous. So they try to pull them up to the top of the slope. Um, out west, you're looking at 45 degree slopes or more where they're gonna look into using those systems. So very steep slopes. In the Appalachian region, I've honestly seen them log with traditional equipment like what we use here up to even maybe 25, 30 degree slopes. It's, you don't believe how they can do it. You think all the equipment would flip over and roll down the hill, uh, but these, these folks know how they're using their equipment. They do a good job. Um, on slopes like these, um, you could also see systems uh, nowadays uh, where basically what they do is they park a big dozer at the top of the hill. The dozer has a winch on it. And it's a cable-assisted operation where they basically send the feller and the skidder down the hill, they fell the trees, and then the dozer, sometimes it's robotically operated, uh, remotely operated, they will basically just winch the piece of traditional forestry equipment back up the hill. And so that's how they may operate on some steep slopes. That's all come around in the last decade or so, that's a relatively new system. The other thing you'll sometimes see, you'll see a boom arm uh, style excavator piece of equipment with a felling head at the end of that boom arm. And so it'll be on tracks. Um, and what'll happen is the tracks may be on this slope that's real steep, 45 degrees running up and down, but the cabin will articulate. So the cabin will be level as it moves up and down the slope. Um, and then from that level position, the operator can then reach around with the boom arm and fell trees, get them set up to be skidded down the hill. And so there's a number of different harvesting systems out there for steep slopes. If you're in an area like the southern coastal plain, most of our loggers aren't going to have any of those systems. So in an area with relatively flat topography, you may have a lot of difficulty logging on steep terrain. Uh, there are a lot of loggers we have around now that won't have a chainsaw out on the operation. They may have some pole saws to trim up log trucks before they send the load off, but they won't have a chainsaw with a two or three foot bar uh, where they could come out and they could fell large trees like some that we're seeing here. Um, with, with logging, it's still one of the deadliest jobs in the country. It's one of the top five deadliest jobs in the country. And so with logging, anything you can do to make it safer is going to be very critical. These loggers uh, all have insurance policies too, and these insurance policies will dictate how they can operate. So many of the insurance policies they have may not allow them uh, to have a chainsaw out on an operation like this.